Let the games begin. All right, before we can talk about carburetors, we need to talk a lot about fuel and air and atmospheric conditions because we stopped to talk about carburetors and fuel injection and pressure carburetors and fuel pumps and turbochargers and superchargers and propellers. And it all has to do with uh, our air and stuff like that and fuel. Um, but I had a thought in my head. So in Canvas, I did the same thing I did um, with uh, last time I was here. Uh, I put in reading quizzes this time. All right, but I just changed them so that the reading quiz is something you can take over and over again. Originally, my thought was, why don't you do that? Because you'll just like choose all the wrong answers and see what the right answers are and fill them in and be done in two minutes. But then I decided, if you want to do that, have fun. If that's the kind of student mechanic you want to be, you be you, right? Um, so it's a tool for you to learn and see how well you do. And you can, but it was a pain in, in my ass. Um, and yours too, because the way it's set up, you'd have to have very specific answers. And if you right didn't get the hyphen in the wrong spot, you got it wrong. And then I have to then I have to grade it. And I'm like, ah, I don't want to do that. So um, anyway, so it's there. I've only got the first week taken care of. I'll go in later and change week two and three and four to allow you to do those multiple times. So all right, but uh, please do read do the reading. Um, it's there for a reason. I don't cover everything. And then my plan is to take some of the questions out of those reading quizzes and put those directly into the instructor quiz. All right, that is a picture of an altimeter, which is not relevant to what we're doing right now. What do you need? There's air. What is relevant is I need a note, a one note. All right. We want that pen. Is it going to work today? It's working. All right. Things are going good. All right. So we need to talk first about the atmosphere, which I think you guys talked a lot about. So this might be um, somewhat of a review. That, that would be some feedback is what I was looking for. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. So we've got some review. There's Phil. So I say, Phil, you didn't tell me what a standard day is? <laughs> I go, oh, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's the standard day? Standard day. Okay, I'm caught up with you. Is what? Um, how many inches of mercury? 29.92 what? Inches of mercury. Inches of mercury. Um, also known as how many PSI? 14.7 PSI. Well, how come all of our pressure gauges, when we buy a brand new pressure gauge, take out of the box that says zero? Because it's PSI gauge. gauge. That's PSI G. It starts at zero. If it was absolute, it would already say 14.7. I go, why? This thing's broken. It says 14.7. All right, but no, that would be absolute. Um, let's see, just because I wrote this in here. One inch of HG. What is HG? Did I do that right? I think it's big H, right? It's big H. Yeah, big H, G. Um, one inch is about 13.6, I think that's feet of water. My notes are wrong. So I may have this story a little bit wrong, but I believe it was Pascal. Was it Pascal? Does anybody know? Who, he figured this out. And so what he did is he took this, this, uh, Imagine, if you will, a kiddie pool, and you had a tube that was 15 feet tall. And so you filled the tube full of water, and you filled the kiddie pool full of water, and you put your hand over the tube, which is sealed on the top, put the kiddie pool, pull your hand out, water's going to come out of that tube until it gets to what level? Equal pressure. Which would be about 13.6 feet. So as the story goes, Pascal did this and figured that out, that standard day then would be, that's not right, one, oh, it would be one inch of mercury would be, I have the right, is one inch there. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So it's kind of like one inch is sort of like close to one foot, if you will. So if we did this with water, we'd be looking at what, 30 some feet of water, right? Okay, so 30 some feet of water. So Pascal did this, yeah. Uh, 
scuba diving 30 feet is a one atmosphere. atmosphere so yeah, it's 33 feet. Salt water. 33, yeah, salt water. About <laughs> yes. All right. So Pascal did this, and the story that I heard is, well, of course he did this inside, and the problem is he had this roof that was peaked right about that point, and he couldn't quite see it, you know. So the glare. So what he did is he carved a little chicken out of wood, and he put it in there so you could see the chicken, right, floating. So where the chicken? Well, it just so happened that what happens when a storm's coming in? Pressure increases. Pressure. Pressure drops. Pressure drops. So what did the little chicken that he carved do? Go lower came inside the house because it was right about the peak of his roof. So a little chicken would drop out. But then it's going to be a sunny day. What do we get? Outside. High pressure. Outside. So a little chicken would... So, well, they burned him at the stake as a witch, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the part I don't know about. But anyway, I, I could just see that happening. So. I mean, he's not like a dumbass for doing it inside. He should probably just go outside. Oh, then everybody would have done that. All right, so that was a long way of saying that. Um, uh, Yeah, we can skip that other part. Okay, so let me see. Uh, what's my temperature? 59 degrees F. That's going to be a big F for Fahrenheit. Or 15 degrees Celsius. I missed the line, but that's okay. 15 degrees Celsius. Um, where? Oh, not sea level. Well, that's, yeah, it starts saying that. Okay, I'll give you that one. That is perfectly dry. Perfectly dry... Um, at a latitude of 40 degrees north. Well, where the hell is 40 degrees north? Bet you didn't know this part, huh? Right about there. Oh. And where do we live? Right about, right about there. So we can experience standard day if it was perfectly dry. So, all right. Let me see. Well, it does. Goes right. There's Rome. He's like, he's like collaborator of Putin. Yeah. There's Rome, so man, Athens. Well, so. no, there's a line that goes right through Putin. Through? Line. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where am I at here? One, two. All right. So we know what a standard day is. And that's just something you just have to know as a mechanic. You asked over and over and over again. And you can kind of, you know, when you're flying to, you can figure it out. Uh, going back here, why would I have something like this here? Have you guys talked about this yet? Well, because the altimeter? It's an altimeter. Because that's well, it has a, a set has for the pressure. Yeah. That's an altimeter. It has the pressure. And laser pointer right here. It's called a Colesman window. And it's adjusted with this knob right here. So as I move this knob, it's going to move these numbers, and it's going to move this hand right here. So if, the, if I got in my airplane and it looked like this, they would be broken because <laughs> we're at the almost sea level here. Um, I would have to turn it backwards around until this came all the way back over to here to about, what are we, about 60 feet right here, I think. All right? It's like Cole's cash. So as a mechanic, you may have to do this in an airplane. You get in an airplane and you want to know what the barometric pressure is for that day. You simply move this little knob until these... Um, hands line up with where you are so this if we were here this would be at the zero and this one right here would be right about here about that's 20 40 60 we're about 60 feet I think right here so that'd be right here and then read whatever is right here would tell you what the barometric pressure is for that day now as a pilot when we're flying and we're talking to the controller and they hand you off to a control like you know what I call flight following and I say you know as I do um, call up what the heck is it you know sack yeah can say sack approach i always call norcal norcal 735 quebec mike is with you just departed lodi headed for palo alto like vfr flight following please and he says very good and he gives me a squat code comes back says stockton altimeter is 2991 so i turn a little knob until it says 2991 and it says that then i'm at it should be 60 feet well no if, if i'm flying already and nice oh, 2991 oh. Then I'm approaching 1,000 feet, so right there I'm at 940 feet, right? So as soon as it gets there, I'm at 1,000. So not important, but so as a mechanic, we can go in the airplane and we set the hands to the feet that we're at, and this tells us our barometric pressure. Or you can listen to ADIS or something like that. But anyway, that's why that's there. All right? So you'll talk more about that in a different class. So any increase in altitude, so an increase... 
in altitude causes causes what? A decrease in pressure. Why is that important? Taking off at 5,000 feet, you might care about that. Causes decrease in pressure. How much pressure do we lose? <laughs> so the pressure, it's called the lapse rate. Lapse rate is one inch mercury, hg, per 1,000 feet. All right, so as we go up in altitude, I'm going to lose pressure. I lose pressure, I'm going to lose horsepower. Let's have a turbocharger. As I lose pressure, the carburetor is going to be affected because it cannot sense this loss of pressure. It's still going to think it has the same volume of air, but the pressure is less, so it's going to dump in too much fuel. So we need to know that. So as we go up, carburetors, fuel injection, pressure carbs are all going to get richer. We're going to talk a lot, talk a lot about rich and lean. Um, so we have a decrease in pressure and a decrease in what else? Temperature. Yes, decrease in temp. Is that good or bad? Good. That's a good thing. Good for the air. Yeah. So temp lapse rate. Is two degrees Celsius per 1000 feet. Or 3.5 F per 1000. Oh, the troposphere? Yeah. Well, it, no, it's defined as where it stays. It doesn't change after that. All right, so the effectiveness, so as we go, this is all about as we go up in altitude, atmosphere, standard day, uh, increase in altitude causes, let me see. Oh, I don't want to do it. Okay, so the effectiveness, effectiveness or density, density of air is reduced with three things. Yes, so we'll start with that one. Humidity. As humidity increases. Humidity, that's how much water vapor is in the air. So if we have more water vapor, it's kind of like this, what weighs more, air or water? Water. water. Air. Va vapor, water vapor, it weighs, it weighs more than water vapor, but not water. Yeah, not water, water, but water vapor. Seals heavier than feathers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, because it's confusing, because you think, what's heavier? Air that is really um, humid, a lot of water in it? Well, yeah, because water's heavy, so that must be more. It's the opposite. Water vapor is light, right? So you're boiling something on the stove and you see a little water vapor coming up. It's rising. I don't know. Okay, so you're not going to get light enough. That's probably why there's no clouds in the Yeah. <laughs> so humid air is not good air for flying or engines. Doesn't like it. All that water displaces the air and it's just, so density goes uh, bad. I'll say bad for now. Um, as altitude increases, as altitude So the effectiveness or the density of air, the air that we want, um, is reduced when we add water as we go up in altitude, because that's a loss of pressure, or as temperature increases. It gets hotter. So when you're flying out of this field here, and you call up, we have ATIS, which is the, uh, not ATIS, it's a a AWOS, Automated Weather Observation so it's just a recording of some instruments. And we're at 60 feet. And if you were to call it right now, 
it would just probably give us a barometric pressure storms moving in i don't know so it might go down a little bit 29.9 something so it's, we're probably pretty close to a standard day just a little bit warm but here in the summer you call them up and it's one of those 110 day degree days and you will hear they'll give a warning warning density altitude is 3,500 feet so what does that mean it's like you're taking off from 3,000 feet so why is it like I'm taking off from 3,000 feet because it's hot so the temperature went up and a little more humid in the summer maybe I don't know not around here yeah not here yeah, it's, it's a dry heat it's a dry heat, but the temperature goes up. So my airplane's going to think it's starting at 3,000 feet when it's really starting at sea level. So that has quite an effect, right? That's not a good thing. So my carburetor is going to know that. It's going to run a little rich. Well, what happens if I decide I want to go up to Tahoe or, and, and I land up there at Tahoe? And, at like 7,000 feet? Yeah, in yeah. the middle of summer. Oh, oh it's even worse. Why is the ceiling on your airplane? Oh, well, all over 14. We're taking classes uh, at, the, at the Placerville PA chapter, and they talked about planes hitting the treetops coming out of Tahoe because they took off during the hot summers. And it was so even though the actual altitude is only, I think that airport might be, what, five, 7,000, somewhere there? It's five or, between five and 7,000. Yeah, it's, the airplane's going to feel like it's much, much higher because the density or or effectiveness of the air is so much less. So the wings aren't going to work well, but in this class we're really talking more about the fact that the engine is not ingesting the air that it wants, and if we don't compensate for that in the fuel system, then it's going to be running very, very rich. Then that is bad. We need a, a more proper mixture. Yeah? So is it more fuel efficient or less fuel efficient to be flying on those hot days? Um, if you have to lean it out more, doesn't that mean you're saving money? Yes. Yeah. So like when I go long distance on my plane, I go high up, yeah. because I can lean the airplane way out and there's not as much drag on the airplane, so I go faster. Mm -hmm. So, more, more fuel efficient. Wise, so flying on a hot day yeah, be more fuel efficient. But you're suffer. As long as you lean it, yeah. How does uh, inlet temperature like, affect your EGT and head temps? A lot. Okay. It really can. Although I've never experimented because I don't want to do that. But yeah, if you fly around with your carb heat on in the middle of summer, oh, that's not that's not good at all. Mostly uh, cylinder head temp, I think. All right, let's talk about altitudes. We already kind of talked about a little bit. I almost pulled this out, but I thought, nah, I'm going to leave it in. Altitudes. There's a lot of different altitudes we talk about in aviation, and it's good to know them. So we have actual, which is the actual measured altitude above sea level actual measured um, altitude above sea level. Uh, we talk, so we are actual above sea level here, I think 60 feet. Um, there's AGL that is above ground level, I'll say. So measured above ground. Maybe above ground. So if I was at exactly 1,000 feet above this spot right here, my AGL is 940. So we're here. The ground right now is at 60. 60. Actual, it's 60 feet above. Sea level. sea level, and if my air, if I was at exactly 1,000 feet in my airplane, I would be at 940 above the ground. Follow? Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good, good. All right, then we have the pressure altitude. Um, that is the pressure as compared to a standard day. Well, easier way to say it is. Um, the altitude read on altimeter ETR when set to 29.92. So 
So it's a non-temperature corrected altitude. So if I wanted to know well, what does my airplane think it's at based upon the barometric pressure, that's what that is. All right, but then we get one more, which really is what really matters. Pressure altitude, I don't think matters for much of anything. Um, you want your density altitude. That is the pressure corrected. For non-standard temperature, corrected for non-standard temperature. Yeah. I think the term mean sea level uh, from around four. Um, what is that level? Well, think about sea level. It goes up, it goes down. So it's the average sea level. It's right. between high, high tide, low tide. Okay. Um, that is what the airplane feels. What the airplane feels based on uh, humidity, temp, and pressure. That should not have been there. Why did I leave that there? All right. So as air density is reduced, as air density, do I have any Back to the Future fans? Yes. You are my density. <laughs> as air density is reduced, power does what? So is power. You think about, I didn't think much about it actually until somebody said a story one time. I had a customer who had a, a, a Funk, it's a fabric wing, high wing airplane. It has a Continental 85, C85 in it, which produces how much horsepower? 85 whopping horsepower. When? Fucking day ever was at the factory when they were testing it. When it was at the factory, brand new, tested it, perfect condition, standard day. Not even shaft horsepower, just what it was. Yeah. So he went on a very long cross country. He's a very big person, and he took a very large person with him in this airplane. And all of their camping gear for a week. I don't know, went to Oshkosh or something, and he landed in like New Mexico. And uh, fueled up, you know, put all the gas he could in it and took off from New Mexico in the middle of summer. And the ground came up and smote him. So as he told the story, the, yeah, it's like a biblical term. Smited, smited smoted. Yeah, the, the past yeah. tense, smoted. It got him. <laughs> so yeah, the, uh, he said the train was like this and he was pulling and pulling and then eventually there was like a mesa. Oh, yeah. And so he pulled up to do that, stalled, came down. It's a fabric wing with uh, wood. And he landed on the wing like that. And his words, not mine, I turned that wing into a bag of sticks. Which is the funny part. But the not so funny part is his passenger. They both survived, but I don't think his passenger ever lived to make it out of the hospital. He, yeah, older guy. So, but he had an 85 horsepower at sea level, standard day, when, well, I hate to when new, but you know, it's. Now we're talking about a high altitude takeoff on a hot day. It was probably producing, I don't know, you know, what, 60 horsepower, something. So it matters. Um, you know, people get into uh, trouble a lot with the Cessna 172s because a 172 has four seats. So they'll put four people in it. And with the engine that can handle two people. So, <laughs> yeah. Are always for bags. Yeah. If, uh, what's that? Back seats are always for bags. Bags, yes. Little dogs or small children. So, yeah. Um, I think Columbia is one of the places that's kind of famous for that. Sort of. It's not a real long runway, and uh, it's very unforgiving. It takes off, and you go right into the trees. So, it's uh, it matters. Um, for every 10 degrees, for air free. I always laugh when I, I talk for a little bit, and then I start writing, and I hear all the clicking. <laughs> Everybody got the pin out. For every 10 degrees Fahrenheit increase 
over standard, over STD, that's standard, say so save time, see world, over standard day, the engine will lose about 1% power. So says light coming tips. All right, so we got our air. We got to hopefully cement it in there. It's not all equal, right? As we go up in air, we go up in temperature, we're going to lose power. Carburetor fuel injection system is going to run rich. That is also a loss of power, which we'll talk about. So it compounds itself. Let's move on and start talking about fuel. All right, before we talk about fuel, we're talking about terms of fuel. And I had an interesting conversation with um, terms with uh, a guy. I, I had to do a thing. So yeah, my vacation. Um, I had to do a. Uh, we had aviation day at the Capitol here, and so we had a booth for the school, and I went, which is kind of cool because I ended up talking with a, a guy who is the uh, distributor for Sling Aircraft, which I've never heard of a Sling aircraft. It's an LSA, a light sport. Yeah. I love it. Super cool. I am absolutely in love with this aircraft. Um, everything about it, it looks not like a light sport. It looks like a, a Piper. They're great lines, but it does run a Rotax. And um, so I was talking to him about what kind of fuel. Rotax do not like 100 low lead. They, they hate 100 low lead. And you have to do extra maintenance when you run 100 low lead. They would prefer car gas or uh, the Swift uh, 92 UL um, unleaded aviation fuel. And uh, they talked about the fact that um, the fuel they run in it is uh, Costco. So they, they, they have a lot of these planes at this flight school. I forget how many, it was like 40 or so. But their fuel they use is Costco gas. And they chose Costco because uh, this this lecture is brought to you by Costco. Um, <laughs> no, um, high turnover. High turnover with Costco gas. They know that it's not fresh, sitting in the tank. Fresh. It's always fresh. And I didn't get into it with him. He just, that was, you know, not the, the focus of my conversation. So, um, so, but they found out that they were having problems because of vapor lock. So they experimented and found out they have to run some sort of combination 100 low lead with car gas because of vapor lock. So th and that's what we're going to talk about is some of these things. And, and he started talking about, oh, yeah, we had to learn a lot about um, uh, vapor, um, vapor numbers and um, pressure number, which I'm now forgetting the number, but oh, vapor, yeah, vapor pressure. And he said, we learned a lot about vapor pressure at this experiment. I'm like, oh, yeah, totally. We're, we talked about in this class. So we're going to talk about vapor pressure. And we'll tie that in. Yeah. So 100 would be less prone to vapor lock then? Way less. It's excellent fuel for. Is it just due to it doesn't evaporate as easy because mm -hmm. of the lead? That's what they, no, not because of the lead, because it was designed not to okay. evaporate easy. Yes. So all right, terms, volatility. That is the gasoline's tendency to vaporize. And from here on out, I think I'm just going to write gas. Gasoline's tendency to vaporize. Liquid gas doesn't burn. You could actually put a match out with liquid gas if you could do it without, <laughs> if you could get through the vapor. Yeah, start from the bottom. That's true. Yeah, yes, yeah, start with the bottom. Take a match from the bottom because yeah, the vapor goes up. The vapor burns. The gas doesn't. So, um, and like diesel, you can't light diesel on fire. You can, from the top down, put a match out with diesel. When I taught firefighting school when I was in the Navy, we would uh, get a five-gallon metal can of diesel, and uh, we would have these ladles. We would light the diesel on fire and, and throw the lit diesel out on the tarmac 
and this is in San Francisco, which, you know, really in black smoke everywhere. I'm surprised they let us do it. And, you know, teach people how to use fire extinguishers and put it out. But to get the diesel lit, we had to put a little bit of gasoline on top of it and throw the match. Well, the funny part about that is the first time they asked me to do it, you know, just go over there and put the diesel and the gas in and light it. And so put the diesel in, put the gas in, you know, finally get the match and whoosh, I had too much gasoline and it went up my face. <laughs> so what do you do in that situation? Nobody saw me. I'm cool. <laughs> Don't worry about that. <laughs> my, eyelash, uh, my eyelashes weren't there when I got here. Um, so volatility is important because liquids and solids don't burn. Only vapors burns. Volatility is important uh, because liquids. I thought this was funny when I, I, I read this somewhere. Oh, that's a Q L U. Like you, you, I. When it said liquids and solids don't burn, I thought, wait a minute, what about a log? I mean, wouldn't like a log burn, wood yeah. burns, but it turns kind of into a vapor and burns is, was the point to this. So uh, don't burn. Well, I guess yeah, magnesium, magnesium oxides. That, really that's true across the board. That's like a fact that solids and liquids don't burn. It's only the vapors that are burned? Is that what you're saying? This thing that I read, yeah. That's important. Well, yes, yeah, because they've been calling it a fire tetrahedron now because you need to have a reaction as well to get some stuff to burn. We've been we calling that since I was in the Navy, and that was a long time ago. We still had <laughs> sails on our ships. Jeez, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fire trying well, when I taught firefighting school in the Navy, whenever we had the Marines come, we had to say triangle because. But when the Navy, the Air Force guys, you know, we could say tetrahedron, like, oh, this is a triangle. So, <laughs> all right. It's just a square with three sides. All right. So volatility is important. If the fuel isn't volatile, it's really not going to burn. The way we want it to. I'm saying that, but I'm thinking, well, diesel is really not volatile, but put it under enough pressure and it's it's uh, lights off on its own. So, all right. Um, by the way, I'm reading a really cool book that Larry gave me about uh, diesel. What was his first name? Halfway through the book, I forgot his name. It started with an R. Anyway. Um, all right. Uh, if it's too volatile, all right. So volatility. We want volatile. The fuel to be volatile so that it vaporizes, so that it burns. But what happens if it's too volatile? Detonation. Not detonation. If it is too uh, volatile, then the fuel will boil. What temperature does water boil? 212. 212, when? At sea level, where does water boil, boil under a vacuum? Right, right now. Yeah, it's like it's simply, right? yeah, so if you take water and you put it in a jar and you pull the vacuum on it, it starts boiling right, at this temperature. So, Somebody boil water at like 70 degrees Celsius on Mount Everest? Oh, yeah. Just as an experiment, they took it all the way up there. And okay. Boils yeah. So you go up in altitude and your fuel is too volatile, it will just boil off. You, know, you had full tanks when you left. You get up to altitude. Where'd it go? Well, it just went out the vent system. That's where it went. So that's not good. So we don't want it to be too volatile. Well, what if it's not volatile enough? Well, then it's cold and you will never start your airplane because it's too cold and the stuff will never turn into a vapor and it's just going liquid through the engine and it's not burning. So you have to have this happy medium there. Um, let me see. Too volatile and the fuel will boil. Uh, that creates air pockets. Creating air pockets. In the fuel lines, in fuel lines, known as vapor lock. That is a very serious thing. When you get vapor lock in your fuel lines, you have this air pocket, then fuel doesn't flow, and then it's why well, they call it a lock. Uh, you can push it out in some cases, but then you get this period of air going through, and that's not good. So you get vapor lock. Why doesn't the air, the vapor lock, just find follow the highest point? Like above? I think it will eventually. Like just to, it's just, it, it happens enough time that it will cause 
Yeah, but then in, in my mind too, I think, but what if you had, and vapor lock happens when you have sharp, uh, sharp bends um, in hot spots. Well, if you had a hot spot on a bend, if it always vaporized in that spot, then wouldn't it stay as some sort of vapor lock in that spot? It's, every time the fuel gets there, it's going to turn into air. Oh, yeah. So, it's or vapor. Like it's, it's like a different air. Different. It, it continues to boil at that spot. That's bad. So, um, let's see. Uh, yeah. Pockets of fuel, vapor lock, or loss of fuel. That's worse here. Loss of fuel through vents. And fuel's expensive. I don't want to lose my fuel. Um, so four, if it's, it's, it's too volatile. So four, uh, if it is not volatile enough, then the fuel will not vaporize. When you want it to, that's a good thing to add there. Vaporize when you need it to, like in the carburetor. So good volatility, good volatility will be, will be volatile enough to start a cold engine But not so volatile, but, but not so volatile as to boil in the lines, fuel lines, that is. How's your hand? <laughs> yeah, you're writing you now, aren't you? <laughs> Back to the notes. It made a mess of my board, too. Yeah. So, with the vapor lock, is, is there ever, I, I, I don't know how to ask, so is in, within the fuel system, is there, all, is there any time where there is, are you always going to have like some small amounts of air throughout the system? Or no, not necessarily. Never air. I don't know, like, when you're running it. No, you shouldn't have. You shouldn't have you, sh you shouldn't, but I think there's a little bit allowed in there, as we're going to see with the um, systems we get into have a means of getting rid of air bubbles. So the um, pressure carbs, fuel injection systems, they sort of have a means to get rid of air bubbles. It's like, oh, we know it's going to happen, so let's just get rid of it this way. So. Is that why you, you, there's those fire blankets that go around those, those little fire tubes here that you go around fuel lines? I think that's in case there's a puncture. I don't think it's really. It's like a. Huh? It doesn't look like a. It's orange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's in case uh, of a puncture inside of the hose, a hose failure that doesn't blow out, or if there is a fire, it doesn't fire. burn through the hose so and create more fire. Insulation it does insulate, but I don't think that's its purpose. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but I don't think it's there for that. Um, let's see, uh, vapor lock. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about vapor lock. Uh, which I already said was a condition uh, that occurs when fuel turns to vapor in the fuel system. Condition when fuel turns to vapor in the fuel system. And we're all in agreement this is not a good thing, this is a bad thing. You want it to turn to vapor after the carburetor. All right, caused by one, low pressures. Where do we encounter low pressures? High altitudes. High altitudes. So as you go up in altitude, you're more likely to get vapor lock. Heat. On a hot day, you are more likely to get vapor lock. Vapor lock or when you just Yes, sharp bends in fuel lines. So try and keep the sharp bends out of it. 
Don't fly when it's hot and stay low. No. So obviously sharp bends and fuel lines, that's just good planning. Uh, which one of these three can we control? Well, C, well, sharp bends yeah. sharp bends and fuel lines, we control that. Uh, can we control the heat? Uh, a little bit. Just cons consider where you the when you build the airplane, which we don't do, um, how you run the fuel lines, keep them away from heat, if they're close to heat, put the fire sleeve on it, which does have insulating qualities. Um, low pressures. Well, if you've got a carbureted aircraft with a high wing like mine, it's nothing. All I have is gravity feed, so I'm not going to increase the pressure. But if I have a low wing aircraft or a fuel injection system or pressure carburetor, I'm going to have fuel pumps. So fuel pumps can help. And we'll talk a lot about fuel pumps when we get to that. What's considered a sharp bend on a I don't know the line. I don't know the exact degree radius. I, I think in forty three thirteen they do have some good radius diameters. I think in there for the uh, so what size. So you use those benders? Those, those benders that they give it. You know, you put a ninety bend in it. Yep, is that that's acceptable. I think so. Yeah, I've always felt it was. You know, just, but so I copy with the. With all the right data for it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, vapor lock. Let me see. We we'll talk about. I think it come back around to some of this stuff. Talk about latent heat of vaporization. That sounds like something you don't want to talk about. Latent heat of vaporization. Which actually becomes a important point when we talk about uh, carburetors, especially, and why carburetors are not the most desired, why fuel injection systems and pressure carburetors become better. Uh, because latent heat of vaporization, and that is, we'll put a definition. The amount of heat necessary to vaporize. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> vaporize a given amount of fuel. Which is to say, fuel needs heat to vaporize. So in order for this fuel to vaporize, we're going to talk about fuel systems. We're talking about liquid fuel, gasoline, aviation gasoline, coming out of the tanks as a liquid. We want it liquid in the tanks. We want it liquid in the fuel lines. We want it liquid through the fuel pumps in the carburation system and then when it's discharged out it's going to come out as a liquid and we need it to turn into a vapor so at that point liquid is not helping we want vapor but in order to turn it into vapor the fuel needs to uh, absorb heat it needs heat and in order for it to get heat something must give off its heat to the fuel which means that something is now going to get cold, cold. So the thing around it will get cold, which is kind of fun. When you guys are running the ground power unit, which everybody's going to run at least twice, uh, once with the Stromberg and once with the Marble Shoveler, you, it's a funny ground power unit. And um, it was something that had a big generator or something attached to it. So we just have the engine. It has a very weird looking intake that just comes off the top of the engine and over and down with a pipe. And you just mount your carburetor and it goes right over the exhaust. So when your carburetor leaks, it goes on the exhaust. And so that fuel evaporates instead of hitting the floor, apparently. So um, great design. But anyway, that pipe right there is going to get really freaking cold. And so put your hand on it. I mean, it's going to get... Um, uh, condensed moisture all over it because it's so cold um, it gets close to freezing so but there been times where I've actually kind of touched it oh, I touched that feel that people are like oh, I don't want to they, oh it's really cold I'm like yeah it's cold so I just told you it's gonna get really cold so the parts around it give off their heat well that means that the parts around it when they get super cold and there's cold air around it are prone to icing, icing. so we can actually icing is a significant problem in aircraft so fuel needs heat to vaporize. Heat comes from metal parts around the carburetor. Heat comes from metal parts uh, around 
the carburetor. So is that why some of them are run through like the oil sump? Yeah, you know what? I have never heard anybody tell me exactly why Lycoming designed their system like that. But possibly yes. It's only one of two things. It's either to A, help cool the fuel, or B, warm the air. Warming the air is not a desirable thing, but Lycomings are far less prone to ice than Continentals. Continentals are the ice kings. Although I've never had my 182 ice up. Yeah. So... It, the, all the metallic parts cool off or have their heat pulled from them. Yes. What is that something that the carburetor does as as a like quasi radiator kind of thing, or is there a? What? Nope. It'll just start icing up if you're not it careful. Just, yeah, I don't want the heat to be here anymore, and that's it. <laughs> it's just the fuel takes the heat, and the carburetor gets cold. The end. Huh. <laughs> he was word of the day. Quasi. Yeah. yeah, the flux capacitor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. So the why in the descent do you have we're more prone to icing? What's that? Why in descent? Yeah. Okay, so carburetor icing is most likely to happen in aircraft carburetors at low throttle settings where you have a significant vacuum on the back side of the throttle plate. So you have a low pressure back there and it causes it to... Uh, oh, because then the air is also cooling it off. Yeah. Yep, see so it throttle yeah, ice. Double, double yep. And when would be the absolute worst time to get ice in a carburetor that starts giving you problems yeah, with power? On, on the and the pattern where you're coming in for landing and you're like, oh, I'm a little short. Let me get a little power. And you're like, uh, there, there's no power to get. So, all right, uh, let's see, where was I? Vaporization. Yes. Um, so, vaporization can cause can cause the air and metal to get cold enough to form ice in the carb. And carb is short for carburetor. And probably out of order, but whatever is vapor pressure. And this was a conversation I had with the uh, sling guy. So the vapor pressure is the pressure given off by, a, it's something you measure. And so you have to have, and you have to be careful now, especially if you're talking about this at an airport, you have a bomb. It's called a bomb, a vapor pressure bomb. And uh, probably because somebody screwed up. Um, and it became the bomb. Let's see there. there. Uh, vapor pressure test apparatus bomb. So you put a given sample of fuel in this little cup right there. And then you heat this to a given amount. And then the fuel, liquid fuel, will turn into a gaseous state causing pressure in here and then you read the pressure on that right there. So if you have a very high vapor pressure fuel, that would be more prone to vapor lock or less prone? More, 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 more yes, yeah. so if it's, it's putting off a lot of vapor, that's more prone to that. Um, so let me see, I'll write this down. But yeah, so the guy at Swift said, you know, they had a, a lot of experimentation with they got one of these things and uh, they experimented with a certain percent of Costco gas versus 100 low lead to see how low they could get that low the 100 low lead concentration mixture before uh, it gave them problems with the vapor pressure because they had a couple of their airplanes quit in flight. So, not a good thing. A spooky. Huh? A little spooky. Yeah. So that's why they, they went to a mixture. And I forget what he said. I want to say it was like 90-10 or something like that mixture. So, and they're down in LA where it's hot. So uh, vapor pressure, that is the pressure given off, given off by a sealed amount of gasoline. in a bomb. Uh, 
the higher the pressure. the more likely the fuel is to vapor lock. I wrote a number here that doesn't mean anything, so I'm just going to skip it. I oh, know. So R -E -I, read vapor pressure for avgas, that's aviation gasoline, is 5.5 to 7.0 PSI at 100 degrees F. Read vapor. 